Okay, good evening. We're going to start right back at the very beginning. This is an ancient cuneiform tablet discovered in uh, Iraq. Um, this was uh, created during the Assyrian Empire um, by the scribes of the Assyrian Empire. Today, you could talk about this tablet for hours, but today we're just going to focus on two little lines, these two lines here at the bottom. And the reason I'd like to talk about these two lines is because despite this object being incredibly ancient, it's around 2,700 years old, these two lines, in fact, contain the entire plot line of what is currently the most popular TV series in the world. <clears throat> uh, um, I don't know if any of you have seen the AMC's Walking Dead. I will admit, it's not the most terribly complicated premise ever. However, these two lines, they say, and the dead will go up to meet the living, and the dead will outnumber the living, which is essentially the, the plot line of every zombie film since George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Now, I'd like to stop there for a second and ask the audience a question about who here has in, watched a, a zombie film at some point and enjoyed some sort of undead film or fiction. And I'm not just talking about zombies, it could be vampires. For example, I know lots of people who have really raved about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Personally, I, I love 28 Days Later. Uh, who here has enjoyed some sort of undead film or fiction at some point? Put your hands in the air. And what's remarkable here is that actually the majority of the audience have put their hands in the air and that we have this ancient text that still resonates so well with modern audiences, like there's this common code of horror connecting the ancient with the modern. Now, there were a few people in the audience who didn't put their hands in the air and don't seem to like zombies or vampires. Uh, this talk is aimed at those people. And they're actually looking a little bit sheepish now. Don't, don't worry, we're not going to eat you alive. Um, um, actually, you know, they're, they're, that's a reasonable opinion. After all, these are logically incoherent, scientifically unfeasible beings that just go way beyond any suspension of disbelief. Um, and that, you know, it's surprising that actually that's the minority opinion in a, in a, bright, in a room full of bright, intelligent people. Um, and I'd like to convince those people that actually there is quite a lot of interesting things going on in the dead. They've got a long and fascinating history, um, maybe uh, some cool, very cool science as well. And maybe by the end of the talk, you realize you might be able to help you with your work too. Now, it's not just ancient Mesopotamian texts where we can find reference to the undead. In fact, once you start looking through the historical archive, such accounts are quite easy to come across. For example, we have accounts from Germany, France, England. And all these three accounts were associated with the so-called 18th century vampire controversy, which was something of a, uh, an early medium epidemic that swept across Europe, bringing in everyone to give their two cents from the Empress of Austria to Voltaire. But we can go back further in time and find other accounts too. For example, this 12th century English account of a Welshman who came, kept coming back from the dead to attack and kill his fellow villagers. And perhaps the, the earliest fully-fledged undead story is this account from the Greek writer Phlegon in the second century AD. And his story actually starts mid-sentence at the top of this page because, unfortunately, we've lost the first few pages of this text. And it begins when the, uh, uh, the maid in a rich household, she walks into the guest bedroom and finds a young man who's staying in the house, eloping with the daughter of the household, which probably wouldn't be too, too strange, uh, except for the fact that the daughter of the household was dead and buried several months previously. And essentially, it's a very early form of the vampire romance story. But these stories that our ancestors told each other, they weren't just tales they told to each other on dark and stormy nights. And in fact, once we move from the historical to the archaeological record, it actually bears testament to a much more grim and gruesome reality, one in which our ancestors were, were truly frightened that the, the dead might just rise up from their graves and, and uh, attack the living. For example, we have a, a series of Polish skeletons that were found with the sickles placed around their neck in a kind of self-decapitating insurance mechanism against the walking dead. Similarly, the same sort of thing placed around the waist. Uh, these are some 8th century Irish skeletons, um, a so-called dig dull, a kind of Irish vampire, if you like, that, where they've rammed a rock in the, in the mouth to stop it biting down on anyone. Similarly, the so-called vampire of Venice, uh, the same technique again. And here we see a British skeleton with another common technique known as stoning, where they've just placed a hefty stone on the body to, to weigh it down in the grave. And also you'll note that the body's buried prone, face down in the dirt. The idea being here that if it tried to dig its way out of the grave, it just simply dig itself further down. And this is where it's thought the, uh, the phrase turning in the grave is thought to have come from. <clears throat> 
Now, some people at this point might raise quite legitimate concerns about overinterpretation of archaeological evidence, e.g., how do we really know what was going through these people's minds when they buried their dead? And at this point, we can turn to another, another discipline and turn to the anthropological evidence, where the, uh, the Victorian archaeologist James George Fraser, who's best known for the Golden Bough, produced another mammoth work about the fear of dead in, in religion, in primitive religion. And what he found is across the world's cultures, fear of the dead was so common that he had enough material to amass three volumes on the subject, which he delivered in a series of 15 hours of lectures in Cambridge. And in his, in his volumes, all the burial practices that we see in the archaeological record, are all, they're all in there. Um, my favourite technique that Fraser recounts is a practice used by the indigenous Australians who showed a kind of macabre ingenuity and no small penchant for slapstick humour. All they'd do to the, the body they feared might rise up from the grave zombie style and start lumbering around was they'd simply tie the two big toes together. Which is simple really, who needs, who needs machetes and, uh, and crossbows when you've got a piece of string? So we can, we can triangulate from a range of sciences, from archaeology, from history, from anthropology, and build up this picture that, that across human history, the undead have been evolving in the minds of the living. And that there's something universal about the whole phenomenon of the undead that spans right across human cultures. Why that is, I think that might be a talk for another day. I'm going to seemingly digress off topic for a second here, but the reason why will become clear in a few moments. Now, genetic scientists, they can, they can take a group of DNA sequences and use certain statistical methods to infer the most likely evolutionary tree or the most likely phylogenetic tree of those sequences. And here we see a recent publication where they showed that indigenous Australians likely diverged from other human populations around 50,000 years ago, and that actually since that time they've been genetically quite isolated, which, seeing as we've just learned they have a vampire-like creature in their mythology, is quite interesting. Um, you know, it's interesting. However, this is where it gets really cool. This is another phylogenetic tree, but this one isn't the phylogenetic tree of DNA sequence. This is the phylogenetic tree of a folk story. And what the authors did here is they took something known as the ATU database, which uh, you can imagine a bit like an academic database version of Grimm's fairy tales. And they took several hundred of these stories and they looked at which cultures they were present or absent in and how that mapped onto the linguistic tree. And within their data set, we can find an entry known as ATU-307, the vampire princess. And in fact, we've already heard one of these, one of these uh, stories, which is the one that Phlegon told in the second century AD, which is the earliest surviving variant in the story. However, you can also find it across this vampire romance, across many, many cultures. And the author of this paper, um, could infer from that that this story likely existed four or five thousand years ago before writing was even invented. Now this story of a story, we, don't just, we can't just trace it backwards in time, we can also trace it forward in time as well. And it's here where the writer Goethe, we, knew, he, we know that he took Phlegon's story and reworked it for his poem The Bride of Corinth. And here in his poem, it stands as an allegory for the religious intellectual tussles of his era. And at the end of Phlegon's poem, uh, at the end of, sorry, um, Goethe's poem, the mother of the household walks in to find the two young lovers and find her undead daughter in the act of killing, killing her, her lover. And at this point, we find one of my favorite vampire lines of all time at the bottom of this page, which are, I think just epitomizes the whole vampire theme so well and so succinctly. Um, and the young must neath my vengeance sink, which uh, even after translation, uh, uh, just, yeah, epitomizes it so well. Now, this, this, uh, this poem was a, a turning point in the history of literature. It really legitimized the vampire theme and influenced the next generation of largely British poets, all of whom had their own ghost romances, Keats, Coleridge, Byron. Um, and they, in turn, went on to influence the next generation, writers such as Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu with his novella Carmilla, which is another one of these vampire romances, which was a direct influence on Dracula itself, published almost exactly 100 years after Goethe's poem. Now, one thing this, this talk has shown us is the enduring power of the undead motif to, to engage with audiences, and this is something maybe we can all think about using. There's quite a few examples of scientists now using it in their work. For example, we have the US Center for Disease Control who have used the zombie motif as a, as a way to engage audiences in disaster preparedness. Similarly, 
Another group of US epidemiologists have, used the, have published a paper on the epidemiology of, of zombies as a way to try and understand the nuances in epidemiological modeling. And as we, we watch the ensuing pandemic roll across the United States of America, I'd like to go back to those, those few dissenters at the beginning of the talk who didn't like, say they liked zombies or vampires and ask them if there's still nothing they can find they like about it. And with no hands now going up in the air, I think you can all consider yourselves well and truly infected. Thank you.